Matthew Campbell has supported Independent Tech News directly for five years. Be like Matthew. Become a DTNS member at patreon.com slash DTNS. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, June 12th, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City with a case of E3 fatigue, I'm Scott Johnson. And uh, I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. You can't spell fatigue without three E's at the end. Mm. At least... And you've been covering E3. You you recovered at all? Uh, a little bit. I'm I'm I just kind of scatterbrained. There's so much information mm-hmm. to soak up every year that it takes about a day and a half for it to all settle. And I think I'm getting there. I think this show actually will help me kind of blow out the dust. We're good. Yeah, we only have one very tiny gaming uh, story in today's uh, episode. If you want a good E3 recap, Patrick Beja did one yesterday. Uh, Scott did one on Current Geek. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's also the monthly video game briefing with Patrick and Scott out there. There's Pixels. There's so much, so much. It's not here, not today. Let's start with a few other things (laughs) you should know. Huawei consumer business CEO Richard Yu told CNBC that the MateBook X laptop launch is on hold because it relies on Intel chips and Microsoft software that are restricted for sale to Huawei by the U.S. It's the first product cancellation, or at least postponement, since Huawei was placed on U.S. entity list prohibiting U.S. firms from supplying Huawei without a license. Yu said that the laptop will not be launched as long as Huawei remains on this entity list. It's too bad that thing's good looking. Uh, the U.S. Federal Aviation uh, Administration rather, awarded Uber the right to test drone delivery of food in San Diego, California. We're just in time for Comic-Con, maybe. Uh, Uber completed a test at San Diego State University in partnership with McDonald's and will now expand the test to other Uber Eats partnered restaurants. The uh, restaurants load meals onto the drone, which flies to a predetermined location. And that drop-off point is then met by Uber Eats drivers who deliver it to the customer. Uber eventually wants to land the drone on the Uber Eats delivery car itself. Yeah, so they don't even have to have a Dropbox down. I'll see if if that works. AMD announced the 7 nanometer Radeon $379 RX 5700 and the $449 Radeon RX 5700 XT GPUs, part of the Navi family. Welcome, Navi. Both cards have RDNA architecture, which AMD promises to have a 1.25x performance per clock and 1.25x performance per watt over the previous generation. The RX 5700 XT has 40 compute units with 2,560 stream processors total, and both cards have eight gigabytes of GDDR6 memory. Cards should arrive in July. More than 5 million people have signed up for 5G in South Korea. The government says it took 69 days to reach that mark. 4G service took 90, rather 80 days to reach the same level back in 2011. So a lot of adoption going on in South Korea. About 85 South Korean cities will have 5G connectivity by the end of this year. All right, Scott, let's talk a little more about what's going on with the Have I Been Pwned database. Well, let's talk about Troy Hunt. If that name's familiar, it's because, you know, he's tied to it. He's announcing he's looking for buyers of his Have Been Pwned or Have You Been Pwned service, which compiles a database of leaked usernames and passwords so people can see if their account credentials have been compromised. This uh, totally saved me once. Uh, Hunt launched the database in December of 2013. The service now has over or almost 8 billion records with 3 million people subscribed to notifications. Commercial subscribers use it to alert members to identify theft and protect online assets from things like uh, credential stuffing and fraud. Hunt has been operating it alone, but is now looking to sell it to a company. He emphasizes that he will remain part of it. It should remain freely available to consumers and customers, and there should be more disclosable, uh, excuse me, should be more disclosure possible with more people working on it. The sale process is referred to as Project Salvbard. Svalbard. Svalbard. Yeah, that's where the uh, the big uh, uh, dump of seeds is in case the rest of the world dies. We've got a copy of every seed in Svalbard. Uh, mm. And so he named it after that because this is like a big dump of important data. Uh, he's been doing this alone. Yeah. Since, since 2013. So poor, poor Troy Hunt. Let's let's have let's have a round of applause uh, uh, for, for taking this on. Fighting the and, good fight. And responsibly trying to make sure it can continue when it's moving past the scale that he can continue to do it himself. There is a business not model. You you mentioned it, commercial subscribers who want to be alerted to identity theft and, and protection against fraud. Uh, so finding a buyer for it is a good thing if it's the right buyer. Yeah. And I wonder who that right buyer would be, especially since Hunt says, 
I still want to work on this project. I don't want to do it by myself anymore. And maybe a company can help grow some of the, uh, he mentions disclosures that are possible and maybe there are different revenue streams, but it's not like he's like, you know what? I'm tired. I don't want to do this anymore. I've been doing it for six years. It, 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 it's, it sounds like it's very important to him that he find the right buyer, not just the right price. I think it's important for the service to, to continue to be really important that he does indeed do that because I don't know, even the appearance of it being in the hands of a company who may be one of the security risks that are highlighted in one of the, you know, breaches that that site helps you know about. Like it's entirely possible that as company, like, I don't know, I'm throwing names out here, but let's say Yahoo, just cause I feel like saying them bought this Yahoo was breached a couple of times. One of the times my name got all hacked up in there and I had to go change a bunch of stuff as a result. It was really nice to know that, but I would, I would feel weird. Well, I mean, I guess it depends on how the company handled it, but it feels a little weird if a company owned it that was also the subject of some of the breaches that are in there. So I hope he finds whatever that happy medium is. There's got to be some kind of security firm or something in the middle ground that's not Apple, Google, you know, somebody huge. Maybe it's somebody just who who has the same desires as he does to keep this kind of security stuff going. I can see Microsoft doing this. Uh, they've built up a lot of goodwill. Uh, it's the kind of thing that people might say, oh, okay, maybe Microsoft would do a good job with. Uh, I could see maybe IBM possibly. Uh, certainly security firms out there, McAfee, et cetera. Uh, you know, Intel owns them. So, so there, there's lots of suspects, but you know who I want to buy it is Mozilla. Mm. I don't know if they have the cash. This is an M&A. It's being handled by VC type people. Uh, but Mozilla could use this as a way to continue to fund their operations, which they're always looking for new ways to fund their operations. We've talked about you know, the idea of subscriptions to features in Firefox, et cetera. Uh, and it would be nice to have this built into Firefox so they could alert you uh, immediately while you're in your browser. And it would be a foundation that, that has a lot of trust and goodwill in the community. DJI introduced a toy robot tank called RoboMaster S1, available now in Japan, China, and the U.S. for $499. It uses 31 sensors to map its environment and can move in 360 degrees by either using a mobile app or coding it to move on its own. Computer vision lets the S1 recognize and respond to gestures and sounds or track objects. It can also shoot beads, gel beads, and they expand in water, you know for battles and fun things like that. An add-on package to be sold separately will include a controller, extra battery, and more gel beads. It comes disassembled so kids can learn how it works as they put it together. It can also be customized and be controlled in Scratch 3.0 or Python. Yeah, this is a great educational tool and it comes out of a, a robot battle competition in China uh, called Robo Masters, the DJI was developing things for, and they decided to make a mass market version of it. Uh, and you know, kids like to battle robots, uh, and this helps them learn to code and have some fun. Uh, and the gel beads, uh, you know, you can ship a bunch of them real small and then expand them in water to be able to put into uh, the robot uh, for the battles. Uh, it all it all sounds great. Uh, even you, you learning Scratch 3.0 or Python uh, is good, especially Python. I think is it's good to help people learn to code. Yeah, yeah, I think I, th I think it just it, for the price, you want a kid who's really gonna love this toy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, because kids can be fickle about this sort of thing. I don't want to build a, you know, it's it's uh, but but I know had it had something like this been around when I was at the appropriate age to kind of be learning to code and want to get my hands dirty, um, it would have been a, a, a very cool cool toy. I, I can see this being used by schools too, yeah. uh, for yeah. you know robot clubs, and there's there's already a bunch of them. We've interviewed some of the the people who run those on on DTNS before. I just wonder if there'll be like a secondary market for these beads, you know, because it doesn't sound like a thing I can just walk into a REI. And really, that's a that's beads. that's your biggest takeaway from the story is the well, secondary market. For <laughs> no, where where do I get beads on consignment? Not at all, because you guys did all the important stuff. I would just say <laughs> that if you're gonna if you're gonna offer a thing that whose one of its main functions is that you can have like war games with it. You need to have a way to refill that easily. And I don't know yeah, what the beads yeah, are where you can get them, but yeah. Can you can you deflate them? Uh, can you dry them out? And right. yeah, yeah. Are they environmentally safe? They're gonna screw I mean, up. I mocked you, but it's a surprisingly practical thought that you're having there. I have well, to I mean, it's, well, it, uh, go ahead, Rich. Oh no, I'm just hoping that uh, it uh, brings down the prices of Lego Mindstorms, which have up until now had like a near monopoly on school education slash robotics uh, for yeah. kids. A little competition. Yeah. yeah. Never heard anybody.
Google generally releases a new Pixel phone in October, uh, which if the pattern holds would lead to a Pixel 4 announcement in a couple of months. Uh, among the rumors are that Project Soli, S-O-L-I, uh, the ability to detect hand and finger movements in 3D space with millimeter accuracy could be built in to the Pixel 4. Uh, there's also been some leaks of cases and form factors. Nine to five Google, however, has sources who say that while XD uh, say that yes, Project Soli will be in there, and XDA developers found reference to a Pixel specific feature called Aware Sensor in the beta version of Android Q. That Aware Sensor controls whether to show or hide settings and includes codes for skip and silence. So we think that relates to Project Soli, and you'd be able to like just wave your hand at a phone and silence it. After a lot of these rumors really started to pick up speed, the Twitter account made by Google tweeted a picture of the Pixel 4, said, here, this is what it looks like. Stop Which is looking an official at, account. Yeah, but stop looking at bad uh, <laughs> mock-ups. Officially, here is the Pixel 4. Uh, it shows two rear cameras and a third sensor and a large camera bump on the phone's back. I. I I think that's hilarious that they're like, you know what? Fine. Let's we're not going to pretend like we're going to keep these secrets till October. Here you go. Here's what it looks like. Sure. Uh, we talked earlier about this. I, I still need to be convinced that gestures for a phone outside of, you know, swiping and pressing and all the combinations thereof, multi-touch and whatever. I need to be convinced that I need that stuff. Cause right now I don't, I cannot think of a situation where I need to wave at my phone when I could just as easily swipe or what if, Something. what if your hands are otherwise occupied what if you're cooking pasta Ooh. fair enough um Ooh, that's wet really hands what hands scott how about that that's a really yeah. good point or you're wearing gloves it's out in the cold mm -hmm. you don't have the kind with the haptic whatever or the uh whatever it is. you don't have that capability okay you got me there i'm trying to think <laughs> of any others though well the, the reason i even bring this up is because this actually happened to me yesterday a couple times because i was making dinner and it, yeah, it's, it's just, I'm just busy. And the phone rang and it's uh, Sirius XM. They call me like 40 times a day and I don't want to answer the phone. And so I went over and I see the number and I'm like, ah, stop. And then it happened again. But this time it was actually a phone call that I did want to pick up, but I didn't because I figured it was just the robocall again. I could also uh, see this as, you know, you, you hear your little text message ding and you just kind of want maybe the speaker to, read it out to you that would be nice mm -hmm. what if i could program it what if what if i'm getting a robocall and i look over and i can see it what if i flip it off and then it just turns off i just give it the bird Ooh, customized gestures yeah right there yeah. and then the thing's forced to just go oh, okay shut down that call we're not going to take that because that gesture means no phone call uh, whatever the gesture is, and it doesn't have to be rude, uh, I, I do find it to be a valuable uh, thing that I would use where I don't have to actually pick it up. I know these are the things like, how hard is it to just pick up your phone and tap the thing? But as busy as we all are these days, every little thing that saves us time just mm -hmm. makes your life better and reduces stress. So I'm all for that. Talk yeah. also kind of cool sci-fi stuff going on. You flicking something out of the air. That's not there to tell your phone to do a thing is very, you know, minority mm -hmm. report for lack of a better example. Yeah, yeah. If this all comes to fruition, I would love to know more details of, you know, does the phone have to be at a certain angle? Does the phone have to be at, you know, three feet or less from you? Because if my phone's in my purse in the other room, gesturing is not going to do anything for me. Well, maybe one day the Google Pixel 4 will become a classic console and they can sell it in a mini form like Konami has decided to do like the rest of the industry and video games are doing. Konami announced a plug-and-play TurboGrafx-16 Mini yesterday. It's all during E3, um, although not part officially of an E3 announcement. But anyway, known as the PC Engine Mini in Japan and the PC Engine Core Graphics Mini in Europe, uh, not to be outdone by classic consoles from Nintendo, Sega, and Sony. Konami wants to get on the TurboGrafx name and get it out there again. Um, this is a side note. Konami is only the third or fourth owner of... The Turbo Graphics IP, it was originally Hudson Soft. They worked with NEC. This is way back in the day and has changed hands a few times. Konami has them now. Uh, anyway, they say that all versions of the system will feature standard functions like quick saves, virtual simulated CRT scan lines. So you can make it look like your old TV and the original four by three aspect ratio. An optional multi tap will also be available to allow up to five players simultaneous play. So all of you Bomberman fans, which is the where that thing originally came from, you should be getting excited about that. Uh, it joins miniature editions of the NES, Super NES, PlayStation, and Neo Geo with a licensed Genesis Mini coming in September. These are the confirmed games. 
R type, New Adventure Island, uh, Ninja Spirit, yes, book one and two, or guys, or have you say it? Dungeon Explorer, Yeez. Okay, of course, Pat. Yeah, <laughs> like Kanye. Uh, oh, you yeah, right, like Kanye. Uh, Dungeon Explorer and Alien Crush. That's not a lot, and surely probably not the final list. Um, I would hope Bomberman's on there, at least Bomberman 93. But um, anyway, they're getting into the game, Tom. They're going to make a tiny console and take advantage of everyone's nostalgia. I mean, this one's exciting because I think a lot of people were like, oh, I, I didn't think we'd ever get a Turbo Graphics. You know, it's not one of the the ones you hear. It's not one of the big three, right? Uh, it makes me have hope for my mini 3DO uh, mm. someday. But I I, uh, I wonder, uh, we were talking about this before the show. I wonder where it ends or if it does, or if just, you know, a few years from now, we'll be getting a mini GameCube. Why? You know, why? Marches on. <laughs> my only answer. Well, here's your, your here's answer to your why. Uh, Roger, because people, it's going to be this shifting timeline. The nostalgia we have mostly as children, which is where we really glom onto this stuff, will be a shifting timeline. They will eventually get to a point where N64 kids are going to go, where's my mini console? And then we're going to get to a place where the the next group of 30-year-olds will say, what, what about the Dreamcast? Where's that? Uh, it's just going to keep going. But I don't think they'll just keep going now. I think you need that time to pass before those things happen. I mean, so, oh. so this is my complaint. It, it's not the actual hardware. It's mainly the case that's been shrunk down. So you're going to be playing it on, on a, essentially an emulator on, on hardware that didn't exist back then. True. So, so really, you're just dressing it up in nostalgia. But you can play these games for the most part on something else and have the exact same experience. Maybe not, not, the, not, not the specific controllers. <laughs> You're, you're not wrong. Um, the SNES example, you can get all those Nintendo games in other places, virtual consoles and stuff. Although right now, a lot of them aren't available on the Switch. So if you want to do it legally, your options are more limited. If you want to go out and go crazy with the uh, the shady sides of how you can preserve video games, well, sure, you got lots of options. But people also like just have the little thing, man. You put it on your shelf. Yeah, some people just buy toys even though they don't play with them. Yeah, I think it's going to do well. Although, although, I, I know Tom's mild mocking tone. I will get to it when the, <laughs> when my kids are old enough not to eat the pieces. It's important <laughs> to note that the the, the, P, the Turbo Graphics was not a giant hit here in the States. So I don't know how much traction we're going to get over here, but it did well in Europe and Japan, so it'll probably do okay. Uh, we, we'll have to wait and see. Bloomberg reports that Google is moving some production of Nest thermostats out of China to avoid tariffs. Google made US bound server motherboard production has already been moved to Taiwan and now Nest will move to Taiwan and Malaysia as well. Google faced a tariff on motherboards because it buys the components and then ships them to the US to build its data centers rather than buying whole server racks, which are not yet subject to the tariff. Wistron, which makes servers for Facebook and Microsoft, said it's considering moving some production out of China as well. The Wall Street Journal reports that Nintendo is shifting some production of its Switch console to Southeast Asia. Yeah, so, I mean, there's really not much to discuss here, but uh, there's been a lot of FUD out there about Huawei and the U.S. and the tariffs and what effect will it have. This is one of the first real tangible effects we're seeing. Not speculation, not stock price, not what if. Uh, but companies actually moving their manufacturing something somewhere because of the tariffs. Uh, and that means they think the tariffs will last long enough that it's worthwhile to just move it out of there and avoid it. And my guess is once it's moved, even if the tariffs do go away, these companies won't want to spend the time and money to move it back. Uh, so it, it's probably going to stay outside of China once it's out. They're just not moving back to the States like a lot of people think tariffs are meant to do. The, the idea is that, oh, well... We'll get these jobs back in America finally because these tariffs will work. Well, they seem like they're working on these levels. I, I didn't going see anybody else. saying that in anything that I was reading. Well, so. there's a certain guy in I charge. Think you're bringing in something you've heard in some other arena into this. I have heard a, an elected official, perhaps the highest elected official. No, that's what I mean. I think you're bringing your your own axe and grinding it here. Well, no, and no, hold on a second. I want to actually argue that. Okay, that's not true at all. I've heard him say the words. We want to bring these jobs and these products and these things back. Yeah, but that's a whole separate. That's a whole separate topic. Well, I'm not. I'm just saying if that's if that's the generalization he's going to throw at us. The truth is they're moving just to other parts of Asia. Yeah, so, but the story here is that tariffs meant to hurt China are hurting China. Oh, I see what you're saying. Well, in yeah. that case, sure. 
I, I guess that's <laughs> good job. Good job, Tara. You're hurting China. Hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. An art installation in Sheffield, England, includes a 16-second video deepfake of Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg uh, that shows him crediting a secret organization with his success. The voice isn't Zuckerberg's, though. This isn't taking Zuckerberg's voice and making it say something he didn't, which could be done. They didn't do that. They got an actor to say the thing about, I credit all my success to secret societies. But the video's body motions and lip sync are realistic. They match everything. And Zuckerberg didn't actually say this. So the installation is actually not meant to fool you. It's meant to raise awareness about social media manipulation. The video has been uploaded to Facebook's Instagram with the hashtag deepfake. And Instagram says it will not remove it. A spokesperson told the BBC, hey, if third-party fact checkers mark it as false, we'll filter it from Instagram's recommendation surfaces like Explore and hashtag pages, just like anything else, but they're not going to remove it. They wouldn't remove any other thing either uh, that, that, that they, they see as not being intentionally deceptive uh, and therefore, it's just a matter of marking like, oh, no, he didn't really say this in case you're worried about that. A few things. First of all, not being intentionally deceptive is still going to confuse a lot of people because we know how the Internet works. Uh, and I and I think that if Facebook were to remove this, the uproar that Zuckerberg was getting treated in a different way than everybody else, all public officials, for example, celebrities, anybody in the public eye, the whole deep fake video thing is, is a real concern for, for people, uh, depending on, you know, if it's humor, okay, that's one thing. If it's designed to, to, to fool a bunch of people into something that could be detrimental to society, that's a whole other thing. So I don't think that Facebook had much of a choice here. Uh, but I, I know Scott, you didn't think that the video was all that realistic, but I'm telling you, people are fooled easily. Yeah. That my mother would have thought this was him because she doesn't know what he sounds like. Right. And I immediately went, that's not even a good impression of Zuckerberg. And so easy for me to tell, but you're right. And it's always a numbers game with this stuff, right? Like we always say, well, I'll never fall for an email phishing scheme, but obviously people do. It's a percentage game. So they could have even gone more realistic with this and fooled even some of us who didn't know or thought that did sound like him. Uh, I remember being fooled pretty well by the Jordan Peele Obama one. Um, cause he does a really good Obama impression. And I, and I, I was taken by it for a minute, just for a minute, but there are going to be people that are really taken by it. So you're right. I'm, I'm totally with you, Sarah, but also this is one of those things. It's like, oh, you have this policy. eh? what if we put your own Mark Zuckerberg in a video and he said stuff now you're going to keep it up. Like it's a, it's kind of a weird little bet, like a, like a challenge, uh, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think these folks actually made it because they want to spark a conversation. So a little bit of it is a challenge, but a little bit of it is just getting people to talk about it because they want to raise awareness to stop people from being fooled, which which is a good thing. I think if this had included Zuckerberg's voice and did not include the hashtag deepfakes, it gets taken down. Uh, I really do believe that this is a a an example of them appropriately applying their policy and saying like, yeah, no, they're, they're not trying to pretend like this is, this is real. They put the hashtag deep fake in there. Mm -hmm. uh, so our only responsibility is to make sure we mark it as false so that anybody who doesn't quite get it, like you're saying, Scott, uh, we'll have extra information to go like, Hey, this isn't, this isn't real. Uh, but we shouldn't take it because it isn't intentionally deceptive. If it was intentionally deceptive, I think they take it down. Well, and this installation is supposed to raise awareness, right? So you go, okay, well that's for the greater good. But I think that's a, that's a tricky thing because if more and more people are worried that everything is fake, which is already a huge problem and companies besides Facebook and Instagram and Twitter's another example. And, and there was the Nancy Pelosi video that one would say, well, I don't think, you know, anybody thought that that was real funny and it did fool a lot of people and it was intentionally meant to fool a lot of people. So you have, you have a lot of circumstances where if, if there is more public awareness of what the tools are and how they can be used and how we can, excuse me, how we can point them out and, and know better, great. But that is not an easy task. I think this is a very unpopular, and I think both of you probably disagree with me, and that's fine. I think there's faker madness. Like there used to be reefer madness. Like <laughs> there are negatives to marijuana use. 
And, and, and then there was this like crazy backlash against marijuana use that made it sound like it was way worse than it is. I think there's fake. Yes. There's problems with fakery. And sometimes people believe sometimes people say they believe even though they don't really, uh, and we're not really like sensibly measuring. I say this all the time and I apologize if I'm repeating myself, what the actual effects of this are. Right. And we won't really be able to decide where this line should be drawn until we sensibly measure what the effects are. Uh, given all of that, though, I think what Instagram's doing here is is you know walking that line pretty well. Yeah, it still feels like bait to me, and I think they're treating the bait properly. They didn't mm-hmm. take it; they're just doing what they're supposed to, and they're applying the thing. So I'm with you 100 percent on that, but I still think it's baity. It's little- yeah. Uh, I think it's meant to be Beatty. It's Beatty yeah. in the service of awareness and art, which you may not think is a, a bad, bad thing. Or it's you may not. And we're talking about it. So yeah. well done. Go. And Good we've job. now raised awareness. We are art. <laughs> I don't know if I like us, but I know we're art. I know we're not deep fakes. That's for sure. <laughs> we're not. We're real. No, we're absolutely. I'm really real. talking. Yeah. Thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit. You're all real too, we hope. Submit stories mm-hmm. and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. If you want to hang out on Facebook, join our group if you haven't already. Facebook.com slash groups slash Daily Tech News Show. Let's take a look at the mailbag. Let's do it. John said in response to Tom's article, you, Tom, about- Actually, Britain- It was Shannon's article. Oh, it was Shannon's article. It was yeah. a cross post. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Shannon Morse, yes. Uh, article about Ring Doorbell Community Service. John says, our local police have invited citizens to participate in their security camera registry. John lives in San Jose, California. John says, like you said, that some of these jurisdictions are requiring end users to turn over any footage from said devices when requested, even though that isn't in line with Ring's terms of service. John links us to the camera registry in San Jose. It's at sjpd.org. And he says it has the following text. Any footage containing or related to criminal activity may be collected by the San Jose Police Department for use as evidence during any stage of a criminal proceeding. John says, I have cameras, not Ring brand, but they do record. And I'd love to help my neighbors catch the bad guys. But the any in the above agreement feels a bit broad. Just letting you know about a citizen wondering the same thing you were. Yeah, this is great, John. Thank you for raising this. Uh, if anybody wonders what he's talking about, uh, Shannon Morse did a post on Patreon about uh, the ring service being used by the police. There's two different things. The quote, he says, some jurisdictions require end users to turn over footage has to do with the fact that they may have a warrant out. And if someone has made the video footage public on the ring service, the police may come in with a warrant and say, you have to let us have that footage. It's public anyway. Uh, There's a separate thing that John's bringing awareness, which is a camera registry in San Jose that you can sign up for and say, yes, I would like to contribute footage from my camera to fighting the crimes. And if you do that, you should know that any footage could be collected for use as evidence during any stage of the criminal proceedings. So it's, it's a good thing to be aware of. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thanks to everybody who emails us. Feedback at Daily Tech News Show. And thanks to Scott Johnson. Scott, where can people keep up with all your fabulous work? Well, they can go to frogpants.com in particular. They can, uh, like Tom said, follow all this E3 content that we did. Patrick Beja and I did all of it. 12 hours of conference audio and video, and it's all available up there at frogpants.com. There are multiple feeds that carry these shows. It's a lot. So if you're into that world, you want to have that video game commentary, you want to go deep, we have you covered. But if you just want a good monthly look at what happened at E3 and why you should care as a tech audience, I recommend the MVB MVBG show, the monthly video game briefing, which is available now. I think Patrick got the new one up. I'm not 100% sure, but we recorded this morning and it was great. It was a great summation of what happened at E3 2019 what it may mean for you. So check that out. That can be found over at frogpants.com slash MVGB. Uh, real quickly, folks, if you're listening to this before four o'clock Pacific time, June 12th, a Wednesday, and you are in Los Angeles near the farmer's market, go to the 326 <laughs> bar. We're, we're probably there or we're going to be there real soon because uh, we're having a meetup. Uh, also, if you're like, wait a minute, that's Shannon Morse article. Did I see that? Well, I don't know. Did you? Are you a patron? Because that's where that stuff goes. If you're a member of our Patreon, you get an ad free version of the show. You get bonus episodes. I just recorded an editor's desk going up this weekend covering all the strategies that the Department of Justice may take in busting up tech companies with antitrust. Even though antitrust is usually about consumer harm, there's lots of consumer harm that isn't and doesn't involve prices. Uh, and so if you want to know that kind of stuff, that's coming 
to the Patreon at patreon.com slash DTNS. Join now. Email us at feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com and join us live. We're live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Justin Robert Young. Talk to you then. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>